So we can discuss binding, and we can, we can talk about interactions between a protein and a ligand in a couple of different ways. We can use our association constant, our K sub A. Our units for that would be inverse molarity. Our dissociation constant, K sub D, our units would be molarity, because KD is equal to 1 over KA. Interaction um, can be related to binding and free energy of binding. Our units for that would be kilojoules per mole. Um, and ultimately, we could use this to discuss delta G and relate it to enthalpy and entropy of an interaction. So if we wanted to look at K sub A, it would be protein ligand concentration divided by protein times ligand concentration. K sub D would be protein concentration times ligand concentration divided by protein ligand uh, concentration. Now, our relationship there is going to connect our delta G to our association and our dissociation constant. And ultimately what you can do and kind of characterize um, association dissociation constants in terms of strong binding would be a KD less than 10 nanomolar. Weak binding would be a KD greater than 10 micromolar. Okay, so whenever, that's just kind of a, a parameter or a, a barometer that you can look at whenever you're kind of thinking about um, the affinity that something has for its, uh, its ligand. So whenever you're thinking about binding strength, um, some of the things that you can kind of look at with just to uh, kind of get you set up for the little bit of the remainder of this class, um, because we're going to be talking about enzyme substrate interactions, we can use our dissociation constant and the magnitude of that dissociation constant to think about, well, what concentration would be considered a, or is a, a sort of normal range for an enzyme substrate interaction. That's going to be anywhere from 10 to the minus seventh molarity to 10 to the minus third molarity. Um, in the grand scheme of things, though, an enzyme substrate interaction is kind of a, a low affinity interaction, which makes sense from the standpoint of you're trying to catalyze a reaction. You want this reaction to move forward, so you want to bind that and then release it because those are the kind of the two parts of the enzyme substrate interaction, the binding, but also the release. Okay, so specificity for a ligand. Proteins typically have a high specificity for their ligands, and only certain types of ligands are going to bind. The high specificity can be explained by the complementary of the binding site and the ligand. So that complementary or complementary uh, shape is going to, or that complementary aspect of the enzyme substrate or the binding site and ligand interaction can be found within size, shape, charge, hydrophobic and hydrophilic character. And ultimately this was, a, or a model was proposed known as the lock and key model. Emil Fischer proposed this back in uh, early 1900s, I believe. And what he proposed was that it's kind of like a lock and a key. An enzyme or the substrate or the, the ligand would be the key and the enzyme would be the lock. Um, you have complementary surfaces that are preformed and that substrate is only going to fit in one spot on that enzyme. Now, another proposal from Daniel Koshland was the induced fit model of ligand protein interaction. And so what this was is that you have your protein and you have a ligand. Now, that protein is not necessarily positioned to directly take on that substrate. And instead, that substrate is going to kind of impose its will. Likewise, the protein is going to impose its will on the ligand. And you have some slight conformational change in that protein and in that ligand that enable this protein-ligand interaction. So if you look at the reactant side of our equation compared to the product side of our equation, we have our protein-ligand complex, where our protein and ligand have interacted with one another, and both of them have changed conformations to establish that interaction between them. That's known as the induced fit model of enzyme substrate interactions, or protein-ligand interactions. Now, globins 
as a class are oxygen binding proteins. We've already talked about myoglobin. And one of the fundamental problems is that protein side chains lack an affinity for oxygen. If you think about what oxygen looks like, it's got um, just going back to Gen Chem 1, you've got two double bonds, you've got two lone pairs of electrons on each oxygen atom. Um, and there's not a amino acid side chain or R group that has a high affinity for that sort of structure. So some transition metals bind O2, but in the event that in the event that, that happens, and when that happens, a free radical is going to be generated in solution. Now that presents a little bit of a problem. Uh, organometallic compounds like heme are very suitable, or they are more suitable, but Fe2 plus in the free heme can be easily oxidized to Fe3 plus. We've already actually talked about the oxidation of iron 2 plus when we were talking about uh, prolyl hydroxylase. Um, but Fe2 plus in the center of a heme molecule, a heme molecule is the actual ring structure that kind of harbors, let's see if I can draw kind of a crude one here, that harbors our iron in the center of it. Ooh, ooh, doop, 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 doop. There's our heme molecule. And Fe2 plus is going to be stabilized in the center of that. So what the solution is to prevent that oxidation, prevent the free radical formation, is to capture the oxygen molecule with heme that is bound to a protein. So myoglobin is an example of that. Myoglobin is a storage protein. Hemoglobin is good for oxygen transport via the protein-bound heme. Now, here's a, a better representation. Yeah, I suppose it's a better representation of what a heme ring looks like. Now, heme is, and if you go on to take metabolism, you'll, you'll learn about this, but heme is a structure that is synthesized from glycine. Um, but this porphyrin ring structure is going to position all four of these different nitrogens so that it can hold that Fe2+, plus, that iron ion, in the center of it, which is going to enable, ultimately, oxygen binding. So what that kind of looks like, and these peach-colored um, rectangles right here and right here, what we're doing is we're looking at that heme ring as a cross section. We've got our iron ion, our Fe2 plus ion in the center of it. These nitrogens around the, the central core of that porphyrin ring, as well as a proximal histidine residue on our, our hemoglobin or our myoglobin protein is going to help stabilize the plane of that porphyrin ring. So whenever that's in the correct position, what that's going to be able to do is bind to that oxygen. So one way that you could look at this, and what we're seeing here is our, um, we've got here, right there, where I drew my arrow, there is our heme ring. We've got our orange sphere in the center, that's our iron ion. Then we have, I'm labeling it A and B. These are a pair of histidine rings. This one that I've labeled A, that's your proximal histidine residue. And the one that's labeled B is the distal histidine residue. So one of the things that's kind of challenging about this is myoglobin is responsible for storing oxygen, just like hemoglobin, which is similar in structure to myoglobin, is responsible for transporting oxygen. Well, the interaction between oxygen and the amino acids that make up hemoglobin and myoglobin is actually quite low because of the fact that it's heme and that porphyrin ring structure that has that iron ion in the center of it that's going to be interacting with and responsible for basically stabilizing and holding that O2 atom or O2 molecule there. Now, one of the inherent challenges is that if you look at O2, which I drew just a moment ago, there we go. There we go. And if you compare that to carbon monoxide, we've got a molecule that is somewhat similar in shape. It's a linear molecule. There are lone pairs of electrons. There are fewer lone pairs of electrons, but there's a triple bond, I believe, if I remember correctly. Um, at any rate, the yeah, I think we're good there. Um, even if it's a double bond, I don't think it really matters. The point is that 
They're similar in shape and similar in size to O2. And so what that means is that carbon monoxide is able to fit in the same binding site as O2. Carbon monoxide binds to heme 20,000 times better than O2 because the carbon in carbon monoxide has a filled lone electron pair that can be donated to vacant d orbital electrons on an iron 2 plus ion. So the protein pocket decreases affinity for carbon monoxide, but it still binds about 250 times better than oxygen. So what these are comparing, these two points right here and right here, 20,000 times better, but 250 times better, is this is in vivo, and this is just heme plus Fe2 plus plus CO or O2. That's, that, that's where that comparison is coming from. So in practice, when you have that protein present, well, then carbon monoxide is not going to bind it quite as well as, or it is going to bind better than O2, but it's not 20,000 times better. What this ultimately means is this has an impact on why carbon monoxide is so toxic. So if you live in a place where you have gas appliances, you, and if you are the owner of the home or someone else's, um, you wanna make sure that they have a carbon monoxide detector because of the fact that carbon monoxide is something that can very easily be bound to um, that central iron ion. Now, what that's going to do, if carbon monoxide, even if an, in a low concentration is present, that's going to take the place of where oxygen needs to go. And if you're talking about hemoglobin, which needs to transport oxygen, well, if there's a carbon monoxide there, you're not gonna be able to transport O2. And so getting oxygen to other parts of your body is going to be completely compromised. Um, so that's one of the reasons, if you were unsure why carbon monoxide was so hazardous and deadly, that's one of the reasons. It prevents O2 from circulating throughout your body. Now, what this looks like, oh good, I was right with the triple bond. Here's an O2 molecule. And if you notice, it's bonded at an angle, whereas carbon monoxide is bonded uh, straight up and down. It's the interaction between carbon and iron that is kind of more favorable. Um, but one of the, the things that we have going on here, this is, this is within the free heme independent of protein. So no protein. So one of the things that that means is that there is no distal histidine residue there. That's so when we talked about 20,000 times better versus 250 times better, the reason that when the protein is present, you have a lower affinity for carbon monoxide than in the absence of protein is because of that distal um, histidine residue. So heme binding to protein affects uh, carbon monoxide versus O2 binding. And so here's our proximal histidine, our distal histidine, and then other residues that are going to be responsible for forming that little pocket there. So we have a hydrogen bond that is formed between your distal histidine and that O2 molecule there in order to kind of stabilize it. All right, well, we will continue on in just a moment.